Now we come to another type of health study, namely epidemiology, which is study of population scale results. And the typical thing we wanted to do, there was this famous H1N1 uh, scare, where flu crisscrossed the world. And this group and the other groups, in fact, uh, modeled this uh, spread. And they did that using um, agent-based technology. And is this um, diffusion of contagions, which are diseases, social unrest, information. So how inf things move across populations is a very big area of research in the network science area. And they can all be modeled by this agent-based approach, which has been developed by this group. Uh, to do this, you actually need to have a synthetic population, because you don't have real people, you can uh, you would be forbidden probably from using real people just on privacy issues. But you also don't have the data on real people. What you do is have a lot of averages, so census information and things like that. And so their approach is to build a set of people which effectively reproduce the averages. And then you use those people to run so people-oriented studies as to how disease spreads, which needs information about how far people are apart and things like that. And that's not so easy to do from averages, but if you actually generate a population of people that obeys the averages, those people allow deeper questions to be answered. This is a 100 terabyte data set um, generated for this global population. It's actually is a high performance computing application currently with MPI, <coughs> an important piece of software from Illinois called Charm++. Um, and the parallelism is um, possible because of the fact that diseases take time to, uh, to, to, uh, to act. And uh, they are intending to extend the, the use of this type of idea to other examples, which we'll see one uh, in the following use case. So agents are introduced here. And agents as done here, an important idea, which is, I mean, if we're doing uh, studying materials, um, which um, then we're going to build that material in terms of atoms or blobs of material, particular pressures and velocities. But if we want to build a, a model of the world, then we're going to have to take more of the, the people as the entity. And people don't obey Newton's laws or Dirac's equation. And so, however, they are, they, you can make a set of rules as to what people do, and then apply them. And so this allows you to build either event-based or agent-based simulations. And this is very famous from um, the way the military uses the model war games. And it's also been um, effectively how video games are constructed. They're constructed from monsters and heroes and things like that, which have rules. Well, what happens when a hero does something with a gun and the monsters within a certain distance and so on? These are all evolutions in time which are done according to rules. So that's agent-based simulations, which are very important. So as well as uh, studying diseases, the same idea can study all sorts of things. And not just disasters like a, a like diseases or earthquakes, and then what people do. They can study the sort of social consequences of an event like 9-11 and or terrorism and things like that. So you can build models which generalize the contagion. Um, and then you can include in that model not just face-to-face -face interaction, but uh, people accessing Facebook and things like that. Um, so they also, as these same ideas are used to do uh, transportation system modeling, you can actually include vehicles in the simulations as well as people. And you can use this to do a critical infrastructure simulations such as power, um, gas lines, and uh, things like that, internet. Um, and as again, we use these circuit activity models. These are this generate a set of entities, a set of vehicles, a set of people, 
which would rep whose act when they're evolved in time, they reproduce the averages, uh, such as those from the sensor. Uh, they point out that they have to fuse a lot of data from different sources, and a lot of data is, is incomplete. And uh, we need to, and also this is a, not trivial because we're preparing a huge model. We better check that this actually bears some resemblance to uh, reality. So validation is important. So here we have um, the graph category, which we actually saw earlier in the diabetes case. Also use graph processing, diabetes um, health, health thing. And the idea behind graphs is the following. Um, if you look at the set of data, the set of things, whatever the items make up the data, they're sort of linked to each other typically. Um, and they can be linked in different ways. Um, and uh, in simulation world, things are either linked to all others, that's the old pairs model, or they're linked to people who are near, entities which are near each other, local interactions. That's typical of the material interactions. However, you can have much more complex interactions. And so everything's a graph, but when the graph category really corresponds to a complicated graph with complex, irregular, possibly time dynamic linkages, which require very subtle processing. Another important category here is the ego category for exascale global optimization, which uh, points out that a lot of these, uh, some of these artificial intelligence problems can be thought of as writing down a some sort of um, function which we need to minimize. And there are various words in the literature such as variational base, lifted belief, stochastic gradient sense, sense and a varying the neck called LBF, uh, sorry, a related method called LBFGS for analyzing um, these types of um, large scale problems to find their minima, uh, multiple multi-dimensional scaling, what I call more generically global machine learning. These are all an important class of problem where a huge amount of data is, is um, modeled in a complicated fashion. And you're trying to find the parameters of the model by fitting the data to the model. So that's ego. Here we come to, a, to another application, biodiversity, in a European project called LifeWatch. Life Watch. And we know that there's a, a lot of attention to uh, species, preservation of species, understanding how species interaction, interact, and that has a lot of sensor data. And um, we need to process that sensor, generate custom sensors, uh, integrate all that work together. And whether it be monitoring for species that ought not to be there, migrating birds, wetlands. And there is a project called OMRI, on, on, which actually takes this life work project and, it, and interfaces it with other environmental uh, subsystems so they can share the actual infrastructure needed for processing. So LifeWatch is meant to develop and, and supply a lot of tool, data analytic and modeling tools. and also to uh, provide workflows that perform particular scientific um, analyses. And uh, it's meant to provide an opportunity to add different types of data. And um, there's something called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is the catalog of information to the, uh, which is, has cataloged to find out all the information in this system, which is a very diverse system. And noting of course genomics information, proteomics information, ecological information such as how much biomass there is in the region, what the density of the various populations are, carbon dioxide fluxes, things like that. This is just a huge amount of uh, information. What did that matter, algae in the, uh, in the ponds are and so on. So this is trying to characterize and present geolocated biodiversity related measurements so that people can study them, put them together. This is a back end resource to support scientific researchers.
So that's the end of the uh, health um, and uh, medical and life science application use cases. Now we come on to uh, deep learning of social networks as the next use case.